If you are a regular viewer of my channel and familiar with my visual storytelling style, you'll know that I do sprinkle in a lot of references about who I am and what else I'm into aside from toys. Case in point, you would most likely know that I'm Asian, Filipino to be exact. I'm big into music, glam rock, alt rock, grunge. I also read comics. I'm a fan of Saturday Night Live. And I grew up watching full grown men in tights or trunks, punch, clothesline, dropkick, fly off the top rope, body slam, and basically beat each other silly inside a four-corner ring, all in order to get that ever-important one, two, three. Yup. I think that over the span of almost 100 stories on this channel, I've made my love for professional wrestling pretty, pretty, pretty clear. Ever since I saw those rough and rugged sheep herders kick the crap out of fan favorite Terry Taylor, as well as seeing the feisty self-proclaimed king Jerry Lawler hurl smoke at his opponents, I was instantly hooked. And my fascination with professional wrestling grew even more when I was introduced to Hulk Hogan's Rockin' Wrestling, which showcased the adventures of Hogan's good guys, or in wrestling lingo, faces such as Andre the Giant, Junkyard Dog, and Hillbilly Jim as they battled the bad guys or heel faction led by Rowdy Roddy Piper. My love for professional wrestling hit its peak in high school where I was eating up pretty much anything and everything that the then World Wrestling Federation would throw my way, from the regular superstars of wrestling show to the big events like Saturday Night's Main Event, SummerSlam, Survivor Series, Royal Rumble, and of course, WrestleMania. I even had that overly simplistic Nintendo game wherein most of your time was spent chasing after each other. I was all in. But it didn't just stop there. I was a wrestling fan well into the 90s and early 2000s as I witnessed the quick rise and eventual fall of rival company WCW that brought us the New World Order and sparked the Monday Night Wars between Raw and Nitro. And of course, as a huge fan of Bret the Hitman Hart, I am still sore over the infamous Montreal Screwjob. Anyway, since professional wrestling was such a huge part of my life growing up, it's no surprise that my love for it mixed into my other major hobby, toys, specifically G.I. Joe. After years of enacting endless battle scenes with my action figures, I started looking for other creative ways to play with my Joes. And aside from making them rappel across a nylon line from a second story window to cross a swimming pool below, I also made them wrestle. Yup, I set up my own wrestling federation starring my G.I. Joes. While you would think that He-Man figures would be more appropriate to populate said federation given their more physical appearance, Joes had more articulation that allowed me to execute a lot of the more complicated wrestling moves and holds. Of course, I had many Joes suffer the dreaded broken crotch whenever I would subject them to the Boston Crab. Plus, my He-Man dudes were all busy competing in their own arm wrestling federation inspired by my love for the Stallone movie, Over the Top. Another story for another time. So I would pull out all the stops for my federation. Aside from taking apart and mixing and matching my Joes to give them distinctively different looks, I had a literal record book. Okay, fine, it was a couple of sheets of graphing paper kept inside a properly labeled folder where I was logging in every single wrestler I made complete with their win-loss records that I would meticulously update after every single match that I would play out. I remember the obscure Battle Force 2000 Joe Avalanche was a favorite of mine with his signature finisher, <laughs> the Avalanche, wherein he would jump off backwards from the top rope and do a mid-air flip and have his mohawked helmet come crashing down on his helpless opponent. He was basically swanton bombing well before the Hardy Boys stepped foot in a ring. And then there was Alpine, whom I mixed in the lower legs of Snake Eyes for some awesome looking black boots. He was renamed Ray, the Gripper, and he was my champion. And he would often compete in tag team matches with his partner, another Battle Force 2000 member Knockdown, as the Bot Busters. And they would literally battle a couple of supersized GoBots that I threw in for variety and more importantly, shock value. Ah, uh, good times. Anyway, given how popular wrestling was in the 80s, I guess it was expected that Hasbro also thought that it would be a good idea to mix in a little bit of that world into their G.I. Joe universe. And so in 1985, the very first Joe character based on a real-life person was created, Sergeant Slaughter. 
So as you must have guessed, given my very long introduction, the man mainly known as Sergeant Slaughter in real life, Robert Rudolph Remus, was a professional wrestler in the World Wrestling Federation. And while he was nowhere near as popular as the golden boy Hulk Hogan, it was his gimmick of a former U.S. Marine turned drill instructor who fought in the Vietnam War that was a perfect fit for the military-themed G.I. Joe. But given that there was strong mutual interest between Hasbro and Remus to add Slaughter into the Joe ranks, from the start they hit a major snag as the WWF owned by Vince McMahon already had a toy licensing partnership with another company, LJN, to produce wrestling figures, making Remus's proposed partnership with Hasbro a conflict of interest. So in order to make it happen, the real Slaughter left the WWF to join another federation, the American Wrestling Association or AWA. And so with that little bump crossed, the G.I. Joe Sergeant Slaughter was born. True to his real-life wrestler persona, the G.I. Joe Sergeant Slaughter, voiced by Remus himself, had a larger-than-life personality known for his humorous catchphrases like at ease disease when addressing his troops, as well as calling his subordinates maggots. He was also portrayed as an almost comically physically superhuman individual. The first Sergeant Slaughter action figure was made available as an exclusive mail away in 1985, but was quickly followed by a retail figure in 1986, packed in with his own very special tank, the Tag Team Terminator, or Triple T for short. And the third version, now with a removable hat, was released in 1988 with an even bigger tank, or to be more accurate, amphibious infantry fighting vehicle, the Warthog. His own action figure aside, the real Sergeant Slaughter also served as a spokesman for the G.I. Joe toy line from 1989 to early 1990 as Robert Remus made appearances in commercials to introduce new figures and vehicles. That same year, Sergeant Slaughter made quite the debut in the cartoons in the miniseries Arise Serpentor Arise, wherein he is called in by General Hawk to come in and retrain the current batch of Joes whom he felt had become a little soft and complacent. As the story goes, with the Joes getting almost completely overwhelmed by Cobra's latest creations, the Battle Android Troopers or BATS, Sergeant Slaughter comes out of nowhere in his Triple T and single-handedly saves the Joes by taking down a whole army of BATS. Anyway, as if the title didn't give it away, Arise Serpentor Arise tells the story of how Cobra, led by Dr. Mindbender, seeks to literally build a new Cobra Emperor. Serpentor, using the DNA of a number of history's greatest military leaders such as Ivan the Terrible, Alexander the Great, Napoleon, and Hannibal. And after the Joes foil Cobra's attempt to obtain the DNA of Chinese general and strategist Sun Tzu, Mindbender sets his sights on Slaughter's DNA as a replacement. Luckily, they fail, but this basically sets up an ongoing, personal rivalry between the Sarge and the new Cobra Emperor moving forward. And after that introduction, Slaughter continues to be a staple in the cartoons, serving as a drill instructor and occasional fifth in command after Hawk, Duke, Flint, and Beachhead. And in one rather comical episode called Ninja Holiday, Sergeant Slaughter is mistakenly kidnapped by a bunch of ninjas to take part in a secret martial arts tournament to find an assassin needed for a special job. As the story goes, Slaughter unsurprisingly wins the whole thing and with the help of the Joes and his fellow combatants, bring down the entire operation which apparently was set up by Cobra Commander in order to find an assassin to take down Serpentor, much to the disappointment of the Sarge. Wacky premise aside though, the episode was even more notable for me because the secret tournament was held deep in the jungles of my country, the Philippines, and I found it quite funny how we Filipinos were depicted as primitive long-haired loincloth wearing oddly bluish skinned people. To be clear, no, I was not offended. I found the portrayal hilarious. But I assure you, although at times I did sport long hair, I do not have blue skin or have ever walked around in a loincloth. Although as a kid, back in the 80s, I did walk around in my underoos. Sorry, was that too much information? I guess I've gotten quite comfortable opening up with all of you, my viewers. Actually, comfortable enough to once again ask for your comments, likes, and subs. In fact, I've gotten even more comfy enough to invite you all to be members and friends at the Toy Shelf and enjoy early access and exclusive videos. As you know, any way you choose to help me will always be appreciated, so thank you. But back to Slaughter. One of the last major cartoon appearances of Sergeant Slaughter was in the 1987 straight-to-video release of the G.I. Joe movie wherein the Sarge is called in to whip into shape the new main character of the movie, Lieutenant Falcon. 
After numerous irresponsible acts of insubordination, Falcon is sent to the slaughterhouse, where we meet the Sarge who makes his introduction with a series of classic Sarge lines wherein he enlightens Falcon on the only two ways out of his command, on his feet like a man or in a ditty bag, an itty bitty ditty bag. Oh, and we also get to meet his new crew, the Renegades. See, after the success of the Dreadnoughts, I believe that Hasbro tried to replicate the same formula by giving Sergeant Slaughter his own bunch of special soldiers, comprised of ex-football player Red Dog, ex-circus strongman Taurus, and ex-Cobra Viper Mercer. Did you notice a trend there? These guys were supposed to be too badass for their former professions. Anyway, try as Hasbro might to make them cool, the Renegades didn't quite catch on as well as the Dreadnoughts and after a couple of years, Hasbro gave Sergeant Slaughter another crew to roll with, comprised of already established shows like Mutt, Low Light, Spirit, Barbecue, and Footloose, all now united under a common mainly blue and brown color scheme and a new name, Slaughter's Marauders. But back to the movie, wherein Sergeant Slaughter, Falcon, and the Renegades successfully infiltrated and blew up a Cobra Terradrome. And later on, in the final battle, as the Sarge soundly defeats the deadly winged creature Nemesis Enforcer, with a couple of body slams and a series of elbow drops dedicating each blow to fellow injured Joes, Alpine, Bazooka, and Gung Ho, to Falcon, to himself, and to Duke, and finally, for the US of A. Classic. Anyway, as big as Slaughter was in the cartoons and the toy aisle, he didn't really amount to much in the original Marvel comics. I mean, yes, he was around and he did have a memorable debut wherein he makes his way into the G.I. Joe headquarters at the same time that the Master of Disguise Zartan is causing chaos, using his shape-changing abilities to evade Joe capture. And in the end, it takes the lucky intuition or just plain luck of the Sarge to successfully suss out the imposter and capture Zartan. But after that, as fast as Sergeant Slaughter came into the G.I. Joe world, it wasn't long before he was slowly and quietly phased out. Not because he was not popular anymore, but for real-world reasons. By the 90s, with G.I. Joe as a toy line slowly winding down, Robert Remus wanted back into the World Wrestling Federation. At this time, Hulk Hogan had just lost his belt to the Ultimate Warrior and Vince McMahon didn't need another major face to push. He wanted a heel. Although, knowing McMahon, I wouldn't put it past him if it turned out that he pushed for the Slaughter heel turn in retaliation for Remus leaving the company all those years ago to get into the deal with Hasbro. But for whatever reason, Sergeant Slaughter returned to the WWF with a twist. Given the WWF's tendency to draw wrestling storylines out of real-world events, in reference to Iraq's invasion of Kuwait, Sergeant Slaughter was reintroduced into the WWF as an Iraqi sympathizer. As part of his heel turn, Slaughter claimed that the USA had gone soft and the acceptance of the Russian wrestler Nikolai Volkov as a fan favorite was the proverbial straw that broke the camel's back for him. And McMahon went all out with his gimmick, giving Slaughter an Iraqi manager in General Adnan and partnering him with former rival the Iron Sheik and even showing off a doctored photograph of Slaughter with Saddam Hussein on national television. Fortunately, Remus drew the line when he was asked to burn the American flag on a live broadcast. He compromised by burning a Hulk Hogan shirt instead in order to spark off a feud with him. Regardless, this particular heel turn was an extremely controversial one as it was reported that Remus received numerous death threats and could not go anywhere in public without wearing a bulletproof vest and had to be surrounded with security personnel at all times. Crazy. Fortunately, controversy aside, this new slaughter managed to accomplish what very few wrestlers at the time were able to do. That is, win the WWF Championship by beating the Ultimate Warrior, with a little help from the Macho Man sneakily bashing in the Warrior's head with his scepter. Granted, his time as champion was a very short one and in truth was more of a transition reign to enable Hulk Hogan to win it back only a few months later. Slaughter does stand among esteemed company, along with Hulk, Macho Man, Warrior, and Andre the Giant to hold the esteemed belt within the 8-year period of 1984, when Hogan first won the title, to 1991 when he would be finally stripped of it and go on an extended leave. Just to put that in perspective, in the following 8-year period from 1992 to 1999, aside from the previous champs Hulk and Macho Man, the title exchanged hands between 15 different wrestlers. 
So as you can imagine, being a turncoat didn't fit in well with the G.I. Joe brand. Instead, Slaughter was quietly shoved to the background or completely left out in many later iterations of G.I. Joe toys, comics, and cartoons. Anyway, once his purpose as a transition champion was served, Sergeant Slaughter eventually made his return as a face character, and moving forward, Robert Remus served in a more backstage role in the WWF, now the WWE, occasionally making the surprise in-ring return to battle some degenerates now and then. And finally, he was inducted into the WWE Hall of Fame in 2004. More importantly though, with Sergeant Slaughter's image finally repaired, the door was once again open for his return to G.I. Joe, which he did in grand fashion as a special SDCC toy exclusive in 2010, wherein not one, but two new action figures were released, one based on his original mail away figure and the second after his Triple T version. At the time, I was living in Singapore, and while G.I. Joe wasn't very popular there, the toys were quite common in retail stores, and these SDCC exclusives were actually available in select hobby specialty shops, so I had no issues picking up this highly sought-after pair of Sarges. I do remember paying around 100 Singapore dollars, which back then amounted to a little under $60 US which was definitely more than what it was sold for in the convention itself. But considering that nowadays these guys are selling on the secondary market for two to three times more per figure, I'd call that a steal in my book. Anyway, at the end of the day, I guess the saving grace through all of this is that unlike many other characters created in the WWF back in the day, the name and likeness of Sergeant Slaughter belongs solely to Robert Remus, and he is free to use it or license it out in whichever way he chooses often to humorous results. As is the case when Sergeant Slaughter made his official debut in 2021 as part of the WWE Motu crossover toy line from Mattel. Yup, Sergeant Slaughter decked out in a military-themed man-at-arms armor was officially made a master of the universe. In the same year, Sergeant Slaughter also got another toy as part of the military-themed line Action Force by the toy company Valiverse. Far from the superhero-styled Slaughter from G.I. Joe, this was a more realistic take of a seasoned and grizzled veteran Slaughter who had returned to train a new generation of soldiers. It's worth noting that the name Action Force was originally the name of the UK version of G.I. Joe, wherein Sergeant Slaughter was known as Sergeant Slammer. And not to be left out this year, even Slaughter's special Triple T tank was made part of the Transformers universe as well, with a new updated toy that transformed into the grizzled Autobot soldier, Cup. This basically makes Sergeant Slaughter, to my knowledge, the one and only character to have some sort of representation in all three toy line tent poles of the 80s with G.I. Joe, Masters of the Universe, and Transformers. Now how's that for a distinct accomplishment? In the end though, I cannot finish off this story without mentioning the triumphant and definitive return of Sergeant Slaughter back into the G.I. Joe ranks where this all started, with this excellent classified figure released last year. It's the perfect plastic representation of the original G.I. Joe drill sergeant that took the Joe franchise by storm back in the 80s. But if I had to gripe though, I only wish that he came with an itty bitty ditty bag. But I guess I'd settle for this itty bitty ditty slaughter instead. Anyway, this was quickly followed up with a Marauders version this year, which, aside from sporting a new deco, came with a few more accessories, including a <laughs> not-so-itty-bitty bag. That being said, I'm quite happy with the original Slaughter for my display. While Sergeant Slaughter was the first Joe to be based on an actual person, he definitely wasn't the last. The Fridge, based on the American football defensive tackle William Refrigerator Perry, was released in 1987. And another wrestler who I mentioned earlier, Rowdy Roddy Piper, was made an exclusive special Cobra Trainer action figure in 2007. But neither of them came close to the impact that Sergeant Slaughter had on the franchise. Hasbro even tried to unsuccessfully recruit Sylvester Stallone's character, Rocky, as a special G.I. Joe trainer and went as far as the toy prototype stage and even created a unique enemy counterpart in the ranks of Cobra. And while the Rocky deal ultimately failed, that said enemy managed to see daylight as one of the more interesting Cobra characters ever created, Big Boa. If you want to know more about him and other crazy Cobra ideas, you can check out his story here. Or if you want to watch other G.I. Joe stories, you can go over here. Either way, thanks for watching, and I hope you come back for more.